In this four part video series, I'm gonna share all of my tips and tricks for catching steelhead. This is part three, drift fishing. I'm Barry Rager, welcome to my channel, Rage Fishing. On this channel, I cover all types of fishing throughout the state of Oregon, but steelhead are my number one. So on this four part series, I'm gonna share my top four methods of catching steelhead. I've already done parts one and two, float and jigs, floats and beads. Now, if you wanna go back and watch those, I'll put the links above. This is covering drift fishing, so part three. And in part four, I'll cover hardware, which which is spinners and spoons. For each method, I'm gonna go over the why and the when to fish that technique. I'm gonna go over the gear you'll need, rods, reels, line and tackle. I'm gonna cover the rigging in detail. I'm gonna talk about the technique, so how to fish each method. And I'm gonna give you some bonus tips at the end. So let's get started with part three, drift fishing. So I'm gonna start out by reading the first paragraph of Bill Herzog's drift fishing book. Tap, tap, tap. The terminal gear bounces down the river, ticking bottom every few seconds through the holding water. Towards the end of the swing, just before you reel in and cast again, the offering stops and pulls ever so slightly. Instinct takes over. You strike hard and feel that unmistakable heavy head shake. Overdosing on adrenaline, you sprint down the gravel bank in hot pursuit of two and a half feet of chrome muscle that is determined to return to the ocean with you in tow. To over a half a million anglers, this is drift fishing for steelhead. I read you that because Bill captures the excitement of what it's like to hook a winter steelhead. But I would highly recommend getting this book. You can get it either on Amazon or on Amato Books, and I'll put those links below. And this book will cover a lot more than I will today, but I'm going to go over my method of drift fishing for steelhead. So drift fishing is one of the oldest methods for catching steelhead in the Pacific Northwest. In fact, when I was just a kid, my dad used to take me to the coastal rivers and we would drift fish with things like this, which is an original oaky drifter. I didn't have much success. I usually just broke off a lot of equipment and got soaked and wet. It wasn't until I was in my late 20s that I got a little bit more serious about steelhead fishing. I had bought Bill's book, this is in the early 2000s, studied up on that, and I started having occasional success, usually with a corky yarn and a sand shrimp tail. So fast forward another 10 years or so, I was talking steelhead fishing with a friend Larry, and he was claiming that he was catching steelhead by using just a single corky. So no yarn, no bait, no scent, nothing. So we made plans to go drift a local river. By midday, both of us had tagged out with hatchery fish, so two each, drifting just a single corky. So at that point, my love for drift fishing was rekindled, and I started drifting just single corkies in an occasional double cross, which I will explain to you and show you how to make in just a little bit here. Now each one of my four methods can be used under a variety of different water conditions but each has their specialty. For me drift fishing works best when the water's medium or high. Reason being is using a magnum slinky you can get your drift gear down to the bottom where the fish are at where it might be a little bit challenging float fishing or even using like a spinner or spin. So now let's talk gear, starting with rods. I like an eight and a half foot casting rod with a fast action. The reason I want a fast action is if I get a strike, I want the ability to set that hook. So let me just show you the rod that I use for all of my drift fishing. It's a G Loomis Steelhead Series. Unfortunately, they don't make this one anymore. It's the 1045C. It's a medium heavy power, fast action. It's rated eight to 17 pound test. I have it paired up with an old Shimano Corrado. This is a 201. This thing's probably about 10 years old, but it's just been a great reel. The nice thing about using a casting reel is you can extend your drift and you still have control of that line and you even can still get a little bit of a feel if you get a strike. Very powerful system, especially when you're fishing those heavy flows and you got to get those heavy weights down into the strike zone. So I'll show you one more rod real quick. This is a G Loomis GL3. It's the 1024S, so it's a spinning model. I had bought this about 20 years ago for drift fishing, and ultimately it's become more of my spinner fishing rod. But it's still a good rod for drift fishing, or at least these specs if you want to use a spinning reel. Medium power, fast action. It's paired up with the Shimano Stratic 2500. I usually run 10 pound test line on here. This might be a great rod if the water is a little bit lower and you still want to do some drift fishing. The problem with using a spinning reel is the ability to extend your drifts. It's still possible, but when you open that spool, you kind of lose the feel of your bait. But this has caught several fish for me drift fishing. 
So moving on to line. Now I'm a holdout for using mono when I'm drift fishing, and this is what I have spooled on right now. It's Maxima High Visibility and 12 pound test. It's bright yellow. It's very similar to Ultra Green, but the reason I like that high visibility is I like to take advantage of those low light conditions. In Oregon, you can fish an hour before sunrise and an hour after sunset. And that bright yellow line just makes it easy to see for casting purposes. Now, if you're going to use a spinning reel, I would recommend using P-Line CX or even Trilene XL. The Maxima line is very strong, but it has a little bit of memory and it's a little bit more challenging to use on a spinning reel. As far as leader material, I use Maxima Ultra Green. Now, I already mentioned that I'm generally fishing with drift gear when the water is at a medium or high height, and so I'm not as worried about visibility of my line. So if you're using 12 pound test as your main line, you're gonna wanna use like a 10 pound test as your leader material. That way, if you get hung up and you break off, more likely than not, you'll break off at your leader and not on your main line. But if you are fishing in low and clear conditions, then you can go with a fluorocarbon like this C this is 10 pound test in the steelhead version, but most of the time I'm just fishing ultra green because it's so strong. For a weighting system, I like to use a slinky. And if you don't know what a slinky is, it's lead shot that's contained in a parachute cord just like this right here. Towards the end of the video, I'll demonstrate how to make these, but the nice thing about slinkies is they're fairly inexpensive to make, and with this type of fishing, you end up losing a lot of gear. But as the name suggests, they kind of slither along the bottom of the river and they don't get hung up quite as much as lead. For hooks, I use Gamakatsu octopus hooks, either in a size two or a size one, depending on river flow. So when the water's a little bit lower, I'll be using a two. And under normal conditions, I'm generally using a one. Now, if you're fishing a little bit bigger water, you definitely could step up to a one knot, or if you're fishing low and clear, you can step down to a size four. But for me, I'm usually either fishing a two or a one, and Gamakatsu makes awesome hooks. They're super sharp. So now for the most important piece of drift fishing gear, the drift bobber, which is the actual lure the steelhead strikes. Nine times out of 10, I'm just using a straight corky. So I have some of my favorite corkies laid out here to show you. My number one color is rocket red. So this is the rocket red. This has a little bit of silver sheen that works too. But if you look in my box, you can see that one whole side is just rocket red corkies. It's my favorite color. So with corkies, they're sized similar to other things in fishing. The larger the number, the smaller the corky. So a size 14 corkies, the one on the end here, it's very tiny. I rarely use those. Next size up is a size 12. I use that quite a bit. Size 10, and then you can see over here, this is a size eight in this luminescent one, so it's quite a bit bigger. So if the water is a little bit clearer, I may use a pink pearl, which is pink and white. And when I'm fishing low light, I'm using these luminescent corkies. This is rocket red luminescent. This is a size eight. I'm generally fishing an eight when it's low light. You know, when I'm taking advantage of that hour before sunrise or hour after sunset, I size up a little bit so that the fish can see that. So nine times out of 10, I'm using a corky like I had mentioned, but if I have time to tie some of these up, I really like using the double cross. This is a lure that I learned from a guy named Mark Davis. He wrote a book on steelhead fishing. I was gonna show it to you guys, but I couldn't find it before doing this video. But what it is, it's a corky with a hole drilled through the side and you pull yarn through. It kind of makes a little bit of a bug appearance, but steelhead absolutely love these things. In fact, I have a video on my channel. It's kind of an older one. It's called Rainy Day Steelhead. I'll put a link above. You really should watch it. It's kind of a cool video. But uh, this is the actual rig. I save like memorable steelhead rigs, but this is the actual rig. It's a rocket red size 12 with white yarn pulled through. But this will just demonstrate how much steelhead love these things. So as far as bait or scent. Now I don't use either. Once I started using a corky or a double cross, I just don't think it's necessary. But if you're going to use bait, I would recommend tying just a little piece of yarn in your egg loop, just so the line doesn't cut through your bait as easily and it stays on your hook just a little bit longer. 
So now I'm gonna demonstrate the rigging step by step. I'm gonna start out with my leader material. I've got some ultra green 10 pound test here. I'm gonna pull out about, uh, about three feet of line. I'm generally fishing about 24 inches, so two feet of leader, and sometimes as much as 30 inches, but let's start with about three foot here. I'm gonna tie on a number one octopus hook using a egg loop. Now even though I'm not using any bait, I still like an egg loop just because it kind of cocks that hook in a little bit, and it's a very strong knot. So I'm going to tie the egg loop, seven wraps, one, seven, seven more, one, seven. Okay, got my egg loop there. Now I store my leader material in pips boxes and if you don't know what those are, they're just a method of storing leader material so that you can tie up your rigs at home. I'll demonstrate real quick how those work. There's a little bit of a groove right there. Put your hook into the material inside. The older ones have cork, the new ones have foam. You put that on and you can just roll that right up into that box. And that protects your leader material while it's in your chest pack or backpack. But because I'm going to demonstrate how this works, I don't need to put it in there right now. Now I'm gonna use the spinning rod for demonstration purposes. My other one's already set up. So the first thing you wanna do for this rigging is you want a sliding weight. So you take a snap swivel. I use just these cheap Eagle Claw snap swivels. They're size 10s in black. I think they're 99 cents. So you take the snap swivel, you put that on your main line so it's sliding. Next, you put a four millimeter bead on your line, just a little plastic red bead. Come in a package that looks kind of like that. And the bead's just protecting your knot from your weighting system. Next, you tie on a barrel swivel. This is a size seven Roscoe, but you can use a size 10 or a size seven. Tie that on with a trilay knot. So two loops through the eye, and five wraps through both loops. Make sure to wet your knot just so it goes together correctly. Cut your tag end off. Now I'm gonna take my leader material. This is 10 pound ultra green with a number one octopus hook on it. I'm gonna put a size 10 corky on it. Now one side of the corky has a little bit of a neck to it. That is the side you want touching the eye of the hook. Slide that on. So now I'm gonna go ahead and tie this on. Now normally I use anywhere from let's say 18 inches up to about 30 inches, but two feet's usually my average for drift fishing as far as leader length. But I'm gonna tie this on just a little bit short for demonstration purposes. So tie this end on, trialing knot, cut the tag end off. So now you attach your slinky to the snap swivel. Just push that through the material on one end and that's your system right there. Again, I've shortened this up just for demo purposes, but the reason I like that sliding weight is twofold. One of which is when I'm fishing, if a steelhead grabs my offering, then I can fill that bite independently of that weighting system. And the other thing is, the steelhead can't fill it quite as well either. So it's a more of a direct connection between you and the fish. So it just gives you just a little bit better feel. So the technique for drift fishing is pretty simple. If you've ever fished for trout on a little stream or river and you've cast out a night crawler on a bait holder with a split shot, you've basically been drift fishing. So you're basically allowing the river's current to pull your offering down along the river's bottom. You want just enough weight so your slinky's tapping bottom every few seconds because that's where the steelhead are holding, right on the bottom of the river. The corkies are buoyant, which will pull that hook up away from the bottom a little bit, so it kind of helps prevent getting hangups. The other benefit of drift fishing is you're able to map out your fishing holes. Yes, you're gonna lose a little bit of equipment, but before long, you'll know where every rock, every snag, every hole is in the bottom of that river, and most importantly, where those steelhead hold. So my basic routine for drift fishing is I start close, I cast slightly upriver and allow that corky to go down through that holding water. If I can, I'll open that bail on my casting reel and extend that drift. And then I'll eat with each cast, I'll go just a little bit further out until I've covered that entire section of holding water. So now it's time for steelhead arts and crafts time. So we're gonna make a double cross. I have this Wheeler Engineering, it's actually a gunsmithing tool and I'm just gonna use it because it has these pre-drilled holes and I'm gonna use those just to hold my corky still. Now you can also use like a two by four, just drill a hole that's just a little bit smaller than the corky just so it holds it in place and that way you're also not drilling into your table. So I'm gonna take a size 10, this is a pink pearl, I like the pink pearl or the rocket red, but I'm just gonna hold that in place. 
I've got a 1 16th drill bit and you want a variable speed drill so that you can drill very slowly. So I'm just going to hold that in place. And you want to drill a hole perpendicular to the main hole in the core key. So you start out slow, and all the way through. Now I'm going to take some yarn. You don't really need a whole lot because it's going to be doubled over by the time you're pulling it through. Now you can pull it through in with one of two methods. You can either take a piece of mono, like I have some 10 pound ultra green right here. You can fold over the ultra green around the yarn, just like so. Kind of hold that yarn in place. And then you put both pieces of that doubled over line through that hole. Now, what you might want to do is you might want to already put your corky on your leader material, just because this will kind of plug up that main hole and make it hard to put your leader through. But you pull that through. Now you can take the line off. Now, Mark Davis, the author of the Steelhead book, I learned this from, he calls these sideburns. I did not come up with that, for the record. And you just want to cut, cut those. You can kind of, it's just up to you how long you want to leave those sideburns or wings, whatever you want to call them, but that's a double cross. Steelhead love these things. So now let's just really quick make a slinky. So this is my slinky making kit right here. You can get a slinky maker, but it's not really necessary. You're going to want a sharp pair of scissors, a pair of pliers, a lighter. I keep a little just one of these little candles in here. This is the slinky making kit. Okay. So the slinky cord that I use is the 300 to 330 size, so it's like for magnum slinkies. What I generally do is I cut off a piece about the size of slinky that I want to use. You light your candle. That way you just don't have to hold a lighter. This is just nylon, so you start with one end and you just want to seal that off. So you're going to melt that material. I get my pliers ready right here just because that starts to cool off pretty quick. So I go ahead and hold that down and that basically seals up one end. Now what's going to happen is some of that melted material is going to kind of get pushed out the sides and kind of make a little bit of a bubble there. I would cut that off because it ends up getting hung up on your leader material. So cut that off. That way it's just flat on the sides. And then because that's kind of exposed a little bit of the thread, I'm just going to melt that just a little bit more. So now if you have one of these tools, they're not absolutely necessary. You can just slide this brass tube into the slinky material. The problem is, is the shot is all different sizes, so sometimes it doesn't slide down through this tube very easily. So I start with just a few. And then it comes with this little ram, ramrod type thing and you just kind of push that down and it slides those down into that slinky material. So I usually only do a few at a time. Go ahead and jam that down in there. Okay, so now I've got six shot inside the slinky material. So I like to leave a little extra material just so that that slinky is really pliable. So I'm going to leave about a quarter inch above the last shot, cut that off. And then all I'm going to do is I'm going to burn that material back in the pliers. Now just like I did on the other end, the, that section that bulged out just a little bit, I'm just going to cut those off flush with the side of that slinky material. And that's completed like that. I generally fish them just like that, and I just put my snap swivel through that loose material on the top. But if you want to go a step further, you can take like a nail, heat up the nail, and then you just touch that material, and it basically will put a hole right through that material for you. It's not absolutely necessary, but it's just one more step that might make it just a little bit easier. So now it's got a hole through that material. So then you can make up a bunch of different sizes. I have them separated by the number of shot in each one. So I've got two, 
threes and fours, fives and sixes, seven and eights, nines and tens, and I even have some elevens for those days that the water's really heavy. But it's a cheap way to have a waiting system. It's just a little bit time consuming. So as a bonus, my friend Richard T created a CAD diagram of this rigging. If you wanna to go to my Rage Fishing Facebook page or Instagram at Steelhead Rage, you can save a copy of that to your phone. That way you have a copy of the rigging while you're on the river. So if you wanna see drift fishing further in action, I'm gonna put a video recommendation at the end for Twilight Steelhead. It's a video from a couple years ago where I hook three steelhead in low light conditions using glow in the dark corkies. Thanks for watching and we'll see you on part four, hardware, spinners and spoons.